Hello and welcome to my third lecture in my series on alcohol. Um, in this lecture I'm just going to tie up some loose ends, some interesting uh, bits of information that I didn't cover in the two previous lectures. I want to talk a little bit about the acute behavioral effects of alcohol. Now, I talked about uh, general mechanisms for the acute effects of alcohol in the last uh, lecture, but I want to drive home on a couple important points here related to uh, alcohol and driving, uh, alcohol and violence, and alcohol and sex. Um, then I want to transition to talking a little bit about some of the chronic effects of alcohol, um, including uh, many of the problems that people have if they drink uh, too much alcohol for too long a period of time. I'll talk a little bit about alcohol use disorders and then actually step back and get into the history of alcohol again. If you think back to the first lecture in this series, you may remember that I stopped kind of in the early part of the 20th century, kind of late 19, or late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. And I want to talk about the history a little bit more because alcohol is a drug which in this country we famously made illegal for a period of time and then made legal again. So kind of the thinking about how society deals with a drug, its prohibition and its non-prohibition uh, is really interesting to consider uh, from, from the perspective of studying alcohol. So I'm going to try and get to that a little bit. And then I'll finish up by talking briefly about some of the treatment options for alcohol use disorders. Okay, so let's consider some of the acute behavioral effects of alcohol. What uh, can happen when people drink alcohol when they become intoxicated? Well, clearly you don't need me to tell you that alcohol and driving can be a really dangerous combination. And some of the um, behavioral effects of alcohol around driving are really quite dangerous. Um, in 2012, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration reported that there were in excess of uh, 10,000 drunk driving related deaths. Um, approximately 30%, 31% of all traffic related deaths are associated with drunk driving. So um, as a fraction of all uh, accidents uh, that can involve driving, the ones that involve drunk driving are pretty large. I mean, it's a pretty significant problem. Those numbers have changed in more recent years, but at least as of today, when I checked the uh, NHS, uh, NHTSA um, website, they were still posting information from 2012. So some of those numbers are probably a little bit out of date, but they give you a sense of the scope of the problem of drunk driving. Now, in the last lecture, I put up some of these tables that highlight um, how much or how many drinks a person of a given uh, gender and given body size would need to consume to get into a range for being dangerous uh, for driving. Um, you know, I'm sure that 0.08 uh, grams per 100 milliliters uh, blood is the legal limit for, uh, for driving under the influence. That's where you could be arrested for being intoxicated behind the wheel. Um, it's also worth noting, and you might not be aware of this, but driving related skills can be impaired even at uh, lower levels of intoxication. And you see this on this table here in the shaded area, highlighting how um, even if you're at a 0 0.05, 0 0.06, 0.07 level intoxication, not technically uh, drunk enough to be uh, drunk driving, you can still have difficulty driving and may be dangerous to yourself or to other people. So here's the table uh, for, uh, for females. Here's the table for males. It's roughly the same information, just adjusted somewhat uh, for the differences between the two genders. And we know uh, that dr um, driving while intoxicated um, at these somewhat sort of sub-threshold levels can be dangerous, both from non-experimental research that's been done where uh, people will uh, do breath tests when they've been in accidents, or if they've died, there'll be autopsies and alcohol levels in their blood will be assessed. And we can find that there's fairly decent evidence that people can hurt themselves or hurt others even when they're not drunk to the level of 0.08. We can also do experimental studies using simulators, like this one here from the North Dakota State University Psychology Department, where we can simulate a driving experience in fairly high fidelity. I mean, I've used this uh, equipment myself, and it's, it's fairly convincing when you're sitting in it. Um, we can get people drunk to different levels of intoxication, put them in the simulator, and measure fairly finely uh, different parameters of their driving ability. And long story short, uh, you can be impaired even when you're not drunk enough to be technically driving under the influence. 
put more simply, blood alcohol content levels as low as about 0.03 are associated with things like loss of motor coordination, slowed reaction time, meaning you respond more slowly to uh, novel stimuli that are presented, especially in your periphery, and to basic decreases in visual spatial attention. Um, these are all problematic when you're doing a task as complicated and as potentially dangerous as driving. So again, the, the take home point here is that it's dangerous to drive even if you're under the legal limit. So if you're, um, if you're out drinking with your friends, if you're drinking on your own and you're trying to be mindful of your level of drinking and your expected level of intoxication, good for you, that's, that's important to do. But please keep in mind that you don't have to hit 0.08 to be all of a sudden magically impaired to drive. You can be impaired to drive even if you're not quite that drunk. And again, we can see this in terms of experimental and non-experimental study. Just to give you a sense of how um, this works, uh, we can measure people at different levels of intoxication and their risk for crashing, say, in a simulator. And you can see that at lower levels of intoxication, you know, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, there's a slight increase in your likelihood of crashing. You know, maybe one and a half times your, uh, you know, regular sober likelihood of crashing. If you get up around the legal limit, around 0.08, you're up to 10 times or 11 times more likely to crash. And you can see very quickly how that risk increases in a nonlinear function uh, at higher levels of intoxication. If you're at 0.10, 0.14. Remember, these are levels of intoxication that NDSU students and other college students regularly achieve when they drink, at least according to the self-report data that I presented in the last lecture. Um, at those levels of intoxication, you can be at something like 40 or 50 percent more likely to crash your car than if you were sober. And at higher levels of intoxication, the numbers really go off the charts. You can be hundreds of times more likely to crash than if you were sober. So you obviously know drunk driving is dangerous. You've heard that from a lot of people over the years. I guess my goal in putting this information in this lecture is just to highlight um, how we study the relationship between alcohol intoxication and risk for um, dangerous driving, and to give you a sense, if you somehow you know were unaware of it, of the scope of the risk involved. So that's alcohol and driving. Let's look at another kind of interesting and potentially important area of alcohol-related behavioral effects. That's alcohol and violence. And I've talked about this a little bit in earlier lectures, but I want to briefly return to it. The data from different um, sources uh, gives us uh, the general impression that alcohol has an association with violent behavior, especially uh, violent criminal behavior. Again, I've talked about that before. Um, this is some data, I think it's, well, I took my notes here, I think this is from like the FBI crime data, but you know, on the order of 50 or 60% of murders, um, domestic violence, um, sexual aggression, even things like child molestation, significant fractions of all those types of behaviors and crimes are committed by people who are intoxicated with alcohol and sometimes with other drugs as well. So there seems to be this association between being drunk and engaging in violent behavior. And it raises an interesting question, of course, which is what's the mechanism? What is it about being intoxicated with alcohol that might lead someone to behave in a more aggressive or more violent manner? Well, there are different theories that have been proposed to account for this association or to explain this association. And one of them that I want to highlight is the so-called disinhibition theory. And this is uh, the idea or this, this theory proposes that alcohol impairs the control of aggression, uh, which makes sense. We know that alcohol decreases activity in frontal regions of the cortex, which are responsible for guiding and planning behavior. Um, when those regions become impaired, people seem to act more impulsively. Um, we also know that alcohol impairs uh, areas of the limbic system, such as the amygdala, which seem to make people um, under impairment less fearful. So it's not too hard to imagine that alcohol may, in a relatively direct and relatively pharmacological way, change the functioning of the brain such that people are less inhibited about engaging in violence. So the disinhibition theory, you know, we, you know, proposes that we tend to inhibit violent behavior because it's you know, it's a, it's a pragmatic and socially responsible thing to do, but when we're drunk, we're just not as good at inhibiting that behavior. A second theory that's been proposed 
is called the cognitive expectancy theory. And this theory proposes that people know or have learned through their experience of watching the media or watching other people's behavior that there is some sort of an association between drinking and violence. Um, we sort of picture these things together in our mind, we have an association between them, and it's possible that when people are intoxicated, independent of any direct pharmacological effect that alcohol is having on them, there may be a more indirect psychological mechanism such that people think, well, I'm intoxicated, I should be behaving in a violent way, or merely being intoxicated kind of connects to or even facilitates thoughts about being violent or aggressive. It's not that these two theories are, are incompatible, they both could in, in part explain the association between alcohol and violence, it's just that the disinhibition theory proposes a relatively more direct, more pharmacological mechanism for the association, and the cognitive expectancy theory proposes a more indirect, more psychologically mediated mechanism for the association. So we could consider these two theories, but of course as, as scientists, as empiricists, we'd like to test predictions made from these theories, and there's a way we can do that. That way is the balanced placebo design. This is just a form of an experimental study, and in the experimental study what we're trying to do is we're trying to manipulate independent variables, the variables that are the presumed causes in the cause-effect relationship. So if we're trying to understand the relationship between drinking alcohol and being violent, there are at least two potential causes. One is the actual level of intoxication that someone has. You know, whether or not the person is, in a real pharmacological sense, drunk or, or not drunk. And the other potential cause is their beliefs or expectations about whether or not they're drunk. If someone merely believes that they're intoxicated or, or knows or, or has reason to think that he has drunk alcohol, maybe that could cause or could lead to violent behavior. So in, in a good experimental design, we might want to manipulate both of those potential causes, both of those independent variables. Now, of course, in an experimental design, we measure at least one dependent variable, uh, a, a, a proposed or potential effect, and here that's going to be some sort of measure of aggression or violence. So again, we're manipulating two independent variables, we're measuring one um, dependent variable. What would that look like in an experimental design? Well, we could make a schematic that looks a little bit like this. We've got our independent variables, and because there are two, and each uh, one has two possible levels or, or conditions, there are four possible uh, conditions that we could have in our experiment. We could have people, or maybe more accurately, we could say four possible groups. We could bring people into our laboratory. Some of them we're going to give alcohol, and we're going to tell them truthfully, you're receiving alcohol, this beverage I'm giving you has alcohol in it. Some of them we're going to bring into our, our study and we're going to give them alcohol, but we're going to lie to them. We're going to tell them this is a non-alcoholic beverage. It's tricky to do this, but it is possible to trick people into consuming alcohol, even if, they're real, or in, even if they believe they're not. We can bring other people into our laboratory and give them a non-alcoholic drink and tell them that it's alcohol, a placebo. Um, and you know, again, this can be a little bit tricky to do, but there are ways to pull it off. And then, of course, we can bring people into our laboratory and we can give them a non-alcoholic drink and we can tell them truthfully that that's a non-alcoholic drink and uh, that would be our fourth condition. So, um, again, four conditions or four groups, depending on how you run the study, of people uh, defined by these different conditions or different levels of our independent variable. And of course, we look at the level of violent behavior among people in all these groups and try to see are any of these groups particularly more violent or particularly less violent than each other. As we discussed in an earlier lecture, um, it's difficult, it's probably impossible, it's almost certainly unethical to uh, allow people to engage in real violence in a laboratory setting. That, that would be dangerous and, and again unethical to do. But what we could do is rig up some sort of a laboratory analog, perhaps have people in our different groups uh, compete in a video game task where they have an opportunity to administer an electrical shock or a loud blast of noise to their opponents, things which are kind of painful and unpleasant but not truly dangerous to, to our participants. And again, we could see, are the people in the group that drinks the alcohol and truthfully knows that they're drinking alcohol, are they the most violent? Are the people who 
um, you know, drink the alcohol but are not told they're drinking alcohol? Are they the most violent? We can compare these different groups. That's our basic balanced placebo design. Well, there's a, a lot of studies have been done like this. I'm kind of describing it as if it's one study, but truthfully, this research using this kind of basic design has been going on for at least uh, about 40 years now. And there's so much evidence now that we can kind of speak in general terms about uh, the relationship between alcohol and violent behavior. And in general, what we see is increased level of violent behavior in groups that were told that they were drinking alcohol. So that is people who drank alcohol and knew truthfully that they were drinking alcohol and also in the group of people who drank non-alcoholic beverages but told they were drinking alcohol. And this provides some support for the cognitive expectancy theory. There seems to be it seems to be the case that merely thinking that you're drinking, thinking that you're getting drunk, is enough to get people to behave in more aggressive ways. So it's not not that this rules out entirely the pharmacological um, uh, you know, disinhibition theory, but it suggests that at least in addition to the effects that alcohol has on the brain, on different systems and structures which may regulate impulsive or even aggressive behavior, there's this additional possibility that merely thinking you're drunk can lead you to behave in kind of aggressive or reckless ways that you otherwise might not uh, try to do. Now there are limitations to all types of studies and we could dwell a little bit upon the limitations of this study, but suffice it to say there's a general support for this cognitive expectancy theory in addition to the theory that uh, there are some basic um, direct pharmacological effects of intoxication on aggressive behavior. All right, so briefly then, that's alcohol and violence or alcohol and aggression. Let's move on and talk about something a little bit more pleasant or a little bit less unpleasant, I suppose. And that is alcohol and sex. Now alcohol and sex in this culture, in many cultures, kind of go together. Um, I think it's not probably too controversial to say that. And it kind of makes sense. Um, you know, people drink in social settings. These are social settings where they're often trying to meet people who may be romantic or sexual partners. And also, you know, drinking alcohol, at least drinking modest amounts of alcohol and early on in the drinking episode is associated with some stimulant effects. You know, if you have a drink or two drinks early on in your drinking episode, you may feel a little bit more energetic, a little bit more um, gregarious or social, a little bit more desirous of sex. Of course, there are also sedative effects of alcohol. And so if you get very drunk, you probably feel sort of overly tired, maybe even a bit depressed and dysphoric. You may have decreased sexual desire at that point. And also at high levels of intoxication, there's frankly just decreases in sexual performance. You know, you're, if you're a man, you're less able to uh, maintain an erection. If you're a woman, you may be less sexually aroused. And sex may really be not all that possible for you, at least well, I suppose it's how depends on how you do sex, but let's just submit that when you're really, really drunk, most people aren't very good at it. Um, but as I said before, there are clearly cultural associations uh, between sex as well. You know that sex and alcohol somehow go together. So a bit like we saw with the uh, relationship between alcohol and violence, the relationship between alcohol and sex is kind of complicated and can involve both perhaps relatively direct uh, pharmacological effects and also relatively indirect, more sort of uh, psychological or cognitive effects. Oh, it's a slide that I uh, probably should have included a little bit earlier just to highlight in case you've somehow missed this and when looking around the internet or reading magazines, the associations between sex and alcohol that exist in our culture. It's, um, it's actually, when I, when I put together this slide a while ago, it surprised me how easy it was to find on the internet images from advertising uh, that involve, you know, fairly frank sexual um, portrayals and also, of course, uh, portrayals of using alcohol. Okay, so we've got uh, cultural associations, we've got perhaps a relatively more uh, biological or pharmacological reasons why there are associations between sex and, uh, and alcohol. Um, let's take a look at how we could study uh, these, uh, study these uh, relationships. Well, one thing we could look at, or one thing we should probably look at, is what does it mean to be sexually aroused? You know, how is it that we can measure how interested someone is in sex? Well, clearly, one thing we could measure is someone's perceived arousal or their self-reported uh, interest or desire in sex, their self-reported sense of how ready their body is to have sex. 
Another thing we could measure is their level of physiological arousal. And um, I'll spare you the pictures of this, but there are a variety of uh, simple laboratory devices that can be used to measure blood flow to the human genitals. Um, and so we could measure basically uh, how ready a person's body is, a man's body or a woman's body is, to have sex. So we can measure, again, both their self-reported kind of perceived sense of how aroused or sexually interested they are, and their more um, uh, you know, biological or physiological level of arousal. Using these type of methods, we can once again make a balanced placebo design where we manipulate people's actual level of intoxication and also their expected level of intoxication. And then rather than just measuring one outcome variable or one dependent variable, we can measure two. We can measure both interest in sex or perceived arousal and physical arousal. So basically the same sort of thing that we saw with studying the relationship between alcohol and violence or alcohol and aggression, we apply that same kind of broad methodology to studying the relationship between alcohol and sex. It's just a little bit more complicated because frankly sex is probably a little bit more complicated than aggression. So how does this work uh, when people actually do research like this? And again, this, these type of research studies have been done for quite a long time and we have a general feeling as to what these relationships are like now. An interesting thing that we found is that the relationships are different for men and for women. Uh, so let's look at men first here. For men, we find that at relatively low doses of alcohol, we see increased perceived arousal and increased physiological arousal. So generally speaking, if you take a man and you give him low doses of alcohol, he'll respond by describing himself as being somewhat more libidinal, somewhat more interested in sex, and also at relatively, uh, will also be somewhat more physiologically aroused, somewhat more apt to have an erection and be ready for sex. At moderate to high doses of alcohol, uh, when we give people, you know, several drinks, you know, getting up to closer to what we think of as like a binge level of drinking, there's decreased perceived arousal and also decreased physiological arousal. So for men, a relatively straightforward picture suggesting that uh, there's this relatively uh, direct kind of pharmacological effect on men's sexual arousal and their use of alcohol. Things are a little bit different for women. Uh, we see that at low doses of alcohol, they have perceived physical arousal. I'm sorry, uh, increased perceived arousal and also increased physiological arousal. So like men, if you give a woman, you know, typically a, a, you know, a low dose of alcohol, one or two drinks, she'll report um, being more interested in sex and her body will be more physiologically ready for sex. But at moderate or high doses of alcohol, women can report increased perceived arousal, but decreased physiological arousal. So their bodies may be less interested in sex or less ready for sex, but they are, uh, in terms of their um, self-reported sense, they may uh, report being more uh, ready for sex or more interested in sex. So again, with women, uh, drinking higher doses of alcohol, there's this kind of disconnect between their perceived sexual arousal and their actual physiological arousal. So something interesting to keep in mind. Um, sex and alcohol, of course, can be, um, I, don't know, I suppose at low doses, can be a pleasant thing, <laughs> can enhance the experience of sex. Um, but it's worth noting that for both genders, higher levels of intoxication can uh, be problematic for sex, both in terms of changing people's interest in sex, also changing their physiological readiness for sex. Um, and although I didn't include slides on this, it's worth pointing out that people's judgment in general is uh, impaired at moderate or high levels of intoxication. So their ability to uh, give consent for sexual behavior is impaired as well. And so being drunk and having sex being, uh, can be risky, uh, both because you can misinterpret what your partner wants, or that partner may misinterpret himself or herself what he or she wants probably best to keep sex and alcohol either disconnected or only connected at the lower end of intoxication where people are better able to judge what they want and give consent for those types of behaviors. So, something to think about. Let's move on and briefly talk a little bit about some of the health benefits associated with alcohol. Um, this is just an interesting sidebar, I think, but it actually takes me back to a time in my life before graduate school. 
I used to work at a wine store before going to grad school, and I remember, this is kind of in the mid to late 1990s, there was a phenomenon that was reported a lot in the newspapers uh, called the French Paradox. And this was the observation that French people and other folks who, who live in Europe tend to eat more fatty foods, or, you know, foods with higher levels of animal fat. They tend to drink more alcohol. They tend to smoke more, but they tend to have lower risk of heart disease. So this seems kind of paradoxical because eating fatty foods um, and smoking as well tend to increase your risk for heart disease. Um, the idea uh, that was floated back then was that maybe there's something about alcohol which is providing a protective effect or a buffering effect against the health risks associated with this type of diet. And there actually turns out to be some truth to this. We find that people who consume alcohol at least if they consume moderate amounts of alcohol, do tend to have lower risk for heart disease, diabetes, stroke, dementia, and even arthritis. So um, in general, there is some truth to the claim that alcohol can be a healthy thing for people to consume. However, and this is an important however, we have to keep in mind that we're talking about low to moderate use of alcohol. And by low to moderate use of alcohol, we mean for most people one or maybe at most two drinks per day, and maybe even not every single day of the week. If we look at someone who is a man and is drinking one or two drinks a day, many of the days of the week, but not every day of the week, and not certainly not drinking more than two drinks, we see over time he's likely to have health benefits, you know, decreased risk for heart disease, decreased risk for dementia, and so on. However, there's a fine line and it can really easily cross over into heavier consumption where you're drinking more than two drinks a day. Um, and keep in mind, we're talking about standard drinks here, you know, standard uh, measured drinks. Um, at those levels of con uh, consumption, there are increased health risks, um, especially increased risks for cancer, increased risks for heart disease, and other negative health outcomes. There's also an increased risk for dependence, that is to say, becoming addicted to alcohol if you're drinking more than two drinks a day. So uh, sometimes back then, people used to ask me about this French paradox. Years later, when I went to grad school and actually studied alcohol, um, people would sometimes ask me, you know, is it healthy to drink alcohol? And my answer is, well, based on the research, it's healthy to drink it if you are an otherwise healthy person, if you don't already have heart disease or other health complications, and if you can be good about drinking a low to moderate amount. If you're someone who can successfully drink one drink a day some of the days of the week, over the course of your life, you may benefit from it. But if you're someone who's going to drink two or more drinks a day for most of the days, and maybe even binge drink on alcohol from time to time, you're probably going to pay some costs uh, associated with that pattern of behavior. And you may be more likely to become addicted to alcohol. So it's something to be very mindful of. Uh, alcohol can be good. Alcohol can be bad too. And the risk of getting too kind of bummed out about this and focusing on the negative, let's talk about some of those chronic effects of alcohol, especially some of the negative chronic effects. Well, when we talk about alcohol, it's easy to use the word alcoholic. It's a kind of a common or, or non-technical uh, term to refer to people who have drinking problems. It's not a term that we use for diagnosis formally. Um, but it's worth noting, uh, using this term, that there's really no typical alcoholic. You know, there's no one picture of a guy or a woman who's drinking too much and having problems. There actually are a diverse group of people who may be drinking too much and having alcohol-related problems. Um, that said, there are a few common features that are worth highlighting. As with other forms of drug dependence, when we look at someone who's uh, suffering or may be suffering from alcohol dependence, we see or we tend to see a preoccupation with drinking. That is, spending a lot of time thinking about drinking, planning drinking, planning to get alcohol for drinking, and of course a lot of time actually drinking, and even recovering from the effects of drinking, you know, getting over the hangovers, dealing with the after effects of having consumed too much alcohol. We also uh, sometimes use a term, and again, this is not a real uh, technical or clinical term, but it's one that you sometimes hear in the literature uh, uh, called symptomatic drinking. This is drinking to cope with stress and not just for social reasons. Now, using alcohol is probably a time-honored way of dealing with stress. There are plenty of people over the years who've had a drink after a long day or after a very busy week or uh, in a time of stress in their lives, and that's probably not a bad thing unless you're someone who's drinking regularly 
as a way of coping with stress, or unless you're someone who's using drinking as your primary way of coping with stress, as compared to, say, talking to friends or getting some exercise or, you know, doing yoga or reading a book or doing any other relatively more healthy thing to cope with your stress. Symptomatic drinking, meaning drinking as a way of coping with stress, especially as the primary reason for coping with stress, that can be problematic. By itself, it's not proof that you are an alcoholic or that you're alcohol dependent, but it's certainly something that should concern you and should concern a clinician like a psychologist or a psychiatrist who's making uh, or who's thinking about making a diagnosis. And along with preoccupation with drinking, we see things like increased problems associated with drinking, like drinking too much, engaging in dangerous behavior when you're drinking, and again, suffering from uh, some of the ill effects of drinking, like hangovers and blackouts. You also see loss of control in drinking, that is, drinking more than you uh, intend to drink. Once you start drinking, you have a hard time limiting or stopping yourself drinking. Um, in the past, uh, this was seen as a very important feature of uh, dependence, like the idea that once you start drinking, you're just going to go on a bender and drink until you've run out of alcohol. Um, that's not always the case. In fact, it's rather rarely the case that people, even people who are quite dependent on alcohol, drink in this way. Um, that said, we do sometimes see people who have drinking problems having a hard time limiting themselves, you know, having a hard time having just one drink, having a hard time having just the two drinks that they want, instead having three or four. Recall that, uh, you know, there's a big difference potentially between having one drink a day and having three drinks a day. If you're the type of person who's having three drinks a day, at the very least, you're putting yourself on a trajectory for increased health problems, but you may also be putting yourself on a trajectory for having increased uh, risk of dependence. So if you're the type of person who struggles to keep it to just one and only one drink, that's maybe an, indi uh, an, an indication of loss of control. We sometimes see among people who uh, are drinking too much or having, uh, you know, sort of chronic use of alcohol, um, emotional problems, including things like increased symptoms of depression, things like sadness, loss of pleasure in other activities that used to be pleasurable, uh, which is sometimes termed anhedonia, um, irritability, and even in some cases, suicidal thoughts. Um, so those are symptoms which may not, you know, be proof in and of themselves of an alcohol problem, but should concern you if you're the person having them, and should also concern or attract the attention of a clinician who's thinking about making a formal diagnosis. <clears throat> this idea of, of the overlap between um, the symptoms of uh, alcohol use disorders and other uh, mental illnesses is formally called comorbidity, just meaning the presence of two or more disorders at one time. And it's worth noting that alcohol use disorders are comorbid with many other mental illnesses. Uh, this table is not great. It's uh, from a, um, a journal that I found, and I'll, I'll probably try and link to it online. But it gives you a sense of the overlap between folks who have uh, different disorders like mood disorder, um, major depression, bipolar disorder, and so on, and their incidence of alcohol use, uh, I'm sorry, alcohol abuse or alcohol dependence. If you focus on the columns on the far right where we're looking at alcohol dependence, that is alcohol addiction, um, being an alcoholic, to use just a more common term, we can see that among people who are alcohol, uh, alcohol dependent, a fairly high percentage of them, you know, a third of them or more, will have uh, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, um, and so on. And there, um, you know, that's expressed there as a percentage and also expressed as in terms of an odds ratio. Um, bottom line, there's an overlap between alcohol use disorders and other problems, including, or maybe even especially mood and anxiety problems. So this can lead you to ask, what's the direction of the relationship between alcohol and um, emotional problems? Is it the case that alcohol use is a risk factor for um, emotional problems? If you drink too much, does it lead you to become depressed or anxious? Or is it the case that being depressed or anxious leads you to drink too much? A kind of a self-medication idea. Um, Truthfully, there's evidence for both of these directions, and it may be different for different people. There may be some people who first begin to suffer depression and start to drink too much. It's probably the case for many people uh, who begin drinking too much that they encounter problems and become depressed or anxious as a result.
can work differently for different people. There's evidence for both of these directions. Other things that can go wrong if you're drinking too much, especially over a long period of time, are obviously things like increased uh, problems with family, with work, with socializing. Um, again, not that these <clears throat> by themselves are proof of um, an alcohol use disorder, of alcohol dependence, uh, but they certainly should be concerning to us as should various uh, physical problems that can accompany chronic alcohol use. Damage to the brain, damage to the liver, damage to the heart, uh, risk for birth defects if you're a, uh, a pregnant woman, and increased risk for cancer over time. This slide here is, is rather uh, sort of fussy and, and wordy, but it gives a little bit more information about some of the specific effects of chronic heavy drinking. Now, again, merely drinking a low to moderate amount of alcohol over time won't put you at much risk of these problems, but if you're drinking more than a little over time, you will be at risk for increased problems in a variety of systems of the body. Okay, uh, moving on, talking about some of the chronic effects of alcohol. Um, in addition to all the stuff I've already mentioned, um, withdrawing from alcohol can be a problem. If you are suffering from, if you're a chronic uh, drinker over a long period of time, if you're a heavy drinker and you try to cut down from drinking or even stop drinking, you can suffer from a lot of uh, severe um, neurological problems. They're sometimes called delirium tremens. Uh, they, can view, they can involve confusion, uh, shaking, and seizures. They can even be fatal. It's, a, it's something that I think people sometimes don't understand. It's that uh, when you're drinking heavily uh, for a long period of time, your body gets used to that level of alcohol, and stopping can even be dangerous or fatal to you. And so people who are trying to withdraw from alcohol safely need to do so under medical supervision. Again, another kind of wordy, uh, kind of uh, fussy table here, but this is trying to give you some of the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal that we might see among people who are heavy drinkers. Uh, so someone who's been drinking heavily for a long period of time, if they try to go cold turkey, that is to stop drinking um, without any support or aid, um, within a, for a few hours, they'll probably show um, uh, you know, sweating, muscle weakness, shakes, nausea, vomiting, etc., etc. Within 24 hours, they can have severe seizures. And even 30 hours or later afterwards, assuming they're still alive at this point, they can have severe agitation, disorientation, hallucinations. And, you know, five or six or seven days out, they can be severely exhausted and dehydrated. To be clear, this is not everyone who tries to quit drinking. This are people who try to quit drinking after a long period of heavy drinking. So uh, if you are someone who's like this, or if you know someone who's like this, who's been heavy drinking for a long period of time, they really need some help and some medical support when they're going through this withdrawal period. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the very end of this lecture. Okay, so there are a lot of problems that can go along with alcohol. You probably didn't need me to tell you that. I want to use this as a, as a jump off to get right back into the history of alcohol, something that I did a little bit way in the beginning uh, of my first lecture in this series. Um, so alcohol, is a, alcohol has some problems. These problems have been known about uh, for a long time and actually in our own history in the United States led to a period of time in which alcohol was made an illegal drug. We go back to the late 1800s, kind of early part of the 1900s, if you recall, there was increasing concern about alcohol-related problems, and there was the rise of the temperance movement. Temperance movement uh, involved, uh, you know, different groups of social activists. It also involved uh, activism by women's rights groups. This is a period in time in which women were asserting their independence and gaining a lot of important political and social rights for themselves, which is a good thing, of course, a growing political power. And women, um, you know, at that time understood that they and their children were often the ones who suffered the most from the excessive alcohol consumption of men in their lives, you know, husbands, fathers, etc. So they had a real um, a need or a, a real interest in curbing the alcohol use that they saw around them. There were also a variety of religious groups at that time who encouraged uh, temperance or even abstinence from alcohol. This isn't a great picture, uh, I know, but it's, uh, it's from an old hymnal which is a set of temperance uh, songs that you would sing if you were having a church meeting um, 
for your temperance organization. You would sing these uh, these hymns and, and songs to kind of give yourself support and encouragement to maintain abstinence. Because of the activity of these different groups, which you kind of collectively term uh, temperance move, the temperance movement, by the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, there were various states that enacted uh, laws prohibiting alcohol in one way or another. But at that period of time, there was no federal law about uh, drugs, about alcohol, or really, frankly, about any other drugs. That changed in 1919 with the passage of the Volstead Act, which prohibited the manufacture, transport, or sale of intoxicating beverages and was served as the kind of the template for the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, which was the Amendment for National Prohibition, prohibiting uh, alcohol. So that was in 1920. This ushered in a period of time we now call Prohibition, when alcohol was, for most purposes and for most people, an illegal drug, so it was very difficult to get. And the reason for Prohibition was to try and curb some of these social and personal problems that alcohol was causing in the lives of Americans. Early on in Prohibition, there, was some, there were some benefits. There was decreased alcohol consumption and also decreased alcohol-related problems. So it's sometimes said nowadays that Prohibition was a total failure, that making alcohol legal had no benefits. That's not really true. I mean, there were, there were some benefits of alcohol Prohibition. Uh, you could argue that, that t attempting to prohibit any drug can at least somewhat curb consumption and may reduce some uh, problems related to drug use. However, later on in Prohibition, there was kind of a rebound where there was increased alcohol consumption, although not as high as before Prohibition, um, as more and more illegal alcohol was smuggled into the country. So alcohol use dipped in the early years of Prohibition, but then rebounded uh, somewhat later on. But there was also um, the additional set of problems of things like organized crime, corruption of, of government officials, the selling of adulterated alcohol, all the things we recognize as the unintended consequences of drug prohibition, whether those drugs are coffee or tea or tobacco or alcohol, or as we'll see in later lectures, things like cocaine or heroin. But when you make a drug illegal, there may be some benefits, but there are almost always some unintended consequences. And societies have had to wrestle with those unintended consequences for literally thousands of years. Um, as recently as the 1920s, our own country was struggling with those problems with regards to alcohol. Well, by the early 1930s, the problems associated with prohibition were too difficult to ignore, and there was passage of the Cullens-Harrison Act in 1933, which basically amended the Volstead Act and served as the template for the 21st Amendment, which repealed prohibition. So just uh, societies uh, or American societies kind of 10 year, a little bit more than that, uh, experiment with prohibition in a sense was declared a failure. It, it's probably an overstatement to say that there were no benefits of prohibition, but there clearly were an enormous number of problems associated with it. In the time since prohibition, um, there are now a patchwork of laws have grown up around how alcohol is shipped and how alcohol is sold. Um, you know this, of course, if you've traveled around the country, going to different cities and states, you know, how late bars can be open, what days of the week liquor stores can be open, whether liquor stores can also sell beer or whether beer has to be sold as a separate institution. Um, you've probably encountered some of those weird laws as you've traveled around. I used to live in the South in Tallahassee, Florida. Not too far north of me, there were counties in Alabama and Georgia that were still dry counties where you could buy no alcohol at any time, you know, dating way back to prohibition. So we have a weird kind of patchwork of laws in our country about alcohol, which maybe reflects in some ways our ambivalence about this drug. It's a drug which is a big part of our history. For many of us, it's a big part of our lives, but it's a drug which most of us hopefully recognize as being at least a little bit problematic. So we have kind of mixed feelings about it, uh, maybe on a personal level and maybe on a kind of a, um, at a government or societal level as well. Okay, so a little bit about history. I just wanted to get back into that because Prohibition really is fascinating and I'll, I'll, I'll link to uh, a few videos from the Ken Burns series on Prohibition, which is fascinating and I highly recommend. Um, let's now, though, finish up the lecture. Let's talk a little bit about treatment. Perhaps you are someone who you know, might have an alcohol problem or you might know someone who has alcohol-related problems. What sort of treatment options are available for you?
Well, as we discussed with regards to um, to uh, nicotine dependence, there's a variety of counseling options available for people who are trying to quit or even cut down um, their use of alcohol. Uh, most of these treatment options involve talk, th uh, uh, talk therapy where people um, work on uh, understanding the things that trigger their use of alcohol, um, work on maintaining behaviors that, that uh, lead to reduced alcohol use or even abstinence, and also help them to manage when they relapse. Because as we saw with nicotine, and as we generally see with most uh, forms of substance abuse, or I should say substance dependence, relapse happens. Relapse can even be common, and good psychotherapy can help you deal with that relapse without having a real uh, collapse over it and totally giving up even trying anymore. There are also some different pharmacological options for treatment. Um, one of these I've already mentioned before, and that is antabuse. Uh, antabuse, or disulfiram, is a drug which you may remember um, blocks uh, acetaldehyde metabolism, which has the effect of making someone who's drunk alcohol and taken antabuse incredibly sick. They, you know, they'll throw up, they'll get dizzy, they'll have a really bad headache. It's very punishing. And so if you're trying to quit drinking, uh, and you take antibuse, it really won't hurt you at all unless you drink. And knowing that will hopefully discourage you from drinking. Uh, again, as I mentioned in the last lecture, the only flaw in this system is that if you want to cheat, you can by just not taking your antibuse. Um, so it takes dedication, and people sometimes use antibuse in conjunction with therapy. And part of their therapeutic goal is to maintain their regular, uh, you know, regularly taking their antibuse. So that's one option that can be helpful for some folks. Another option is naltrexone, which is sold under a number of different names like Revia, Depaid. Um, naltrexone is an interesting drug. It's an opioid antagonist, meaning it blocks opioid receptors in the brain and elsewhere in the central nervous system. It was originally developed to treat uh, opiate addiction or opiate dependence by blocking these receptors, making the experience of taking um, a heroin or other opiates less pleasurable and less rewarding. It seems to have a similar effect on alcohol, although the mechanisms are not fully understood. It's not totally clear why taking this essentially opiate dependence drug also helps with alcohol dependence. There's some sense of why that might be. You know, these most drugs that are addictive use common pathways, including the dopamine pathways, and there's some sense that changes in the opiate systems may influence downstream changes in dopamine pathways. But however it works, naltrexone is fairly effective for people at reducing the reward associated with alcohol use and even the craving associated with alcohol use. Another drug which is given is uh, Camprel. Uh, Camprel um, is an interesting drug. It's good for treating uh, people when they're in uh, withdrawal from alcohol. It increases the inhibitory effects of gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA, and also changes some of the neurotransmitter systems uh, that are involved, uh, that are influenced by alcohol. So as you're withdrawing from alcohol and your GABA systems are readjusting, uh, they can they can become overly active, which can lead to some of the dangerous and unpleasant symptoms associated with withdrawal, like shaking and seizures and hallucinations. Taking uh, Camprel can help manage that. It can help manage some of those withdrawal symptoms, making withdrawal safer for you and also less unpleasant. So there's less negative reinforcement for going back to using uh, alcohol. So another treatment option. Those. Those three uh, drugs are the ones that are uh, commonly recognized as treatments for alcohol use. Okay, so those are uh, a little bit about treatment. Um, to wrap up, let's do a quick preview of what's coming next. Uh, next time we'll be talking a little bit about sedatives and stimulants. Uh, the next classes, well, two classes of drugs that I want to talk about. But in the time between now and then, why don't you just relax, uh, take a little break if you can. Enjoy a bit of the summer, and uh, thank you so much for your attention. As I always say, if you have questions or comments, put them in the comments section of YouTube, or put them in the discussions board uh, boards on Blackboard. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, again, thanks for your attention, and I'll see you next time.